Okay, good evening. Um, two things. First of all, lawyers are said always to have the last word. It's not my fault. The last person cancelled, and there was a lawyer, I believe. Second, now naturally I keep you from your evening drinks, from a glass of beer or wine, uh, but I'll try not to um, uh, exploit your patience. Um, and I will skip most importantly many things that have already been said uh, as regards to the wider topic of copyright reform. I will focus in my brief presentation on the role or the presence of the user, whatever that might be, in the current consideration in reforming European copyright law. Um, I think it is important, I'm probably not the only person who thinks that, um, based on the fact that during the last consultation, which was launched um, in late 2014 on the reform of European copyright law, the majority of people who submitted uh, their opinions on the questions asked by the European Commission um, classified or, or described themselves as users, probably users in the wider sense, but as opposed to right holders or those uh, institutions or individuals who claim to be right holders. Uh, so more than 5,500 replies came from people who claim to be users uh, out of a total of the numbers differ 9,500 to 10,500 uh, submissions. Uh, the Commission says 9,500. I've read all kinds of different numbers. Uh, the first difficult issue that you encounter when you talk about the user is that this is a group that is not very homogenous. Um, that can be private users, that can be non-commercial institution users. I will summarize these individuals who claimed to be users as users. A differentiation would be very, very difficult, probably close to impossible. Uh, I will relate the interest expressed by this group that I call users um, to two different fields that are of particular importance. Uh, to private users. First of all, digital resale, uh, and second of all, user-generated contents. I picked these two fields because, first of all, they're very close to my heart, and most importantly, there have also been cases by the Court of Justice that dealt with these two particular issues, uh, directly or indirectly. Um, and this is so important, again, from a legal perspective, because the Court of Justice, for a very, very long time, has been the driving force of copyright harmonization. As we learned earlier today, many of the directors, or at least three of them we find in the current copyright are key, are a result of what has been branded judicial activism by the European Court of Justice. So let's turn to the first example, the resale of digital content, uh, MP3 files, movies that a user has purchased or has otherwise legal access to. And we had this infamous use of case, which was about the resale of software by a company to another company via an intermediary. A very, very complicated legal setting. There are many opinions about that. Um, but it was about the resale of software based on the software directive. Uh, the next, next step took place, or the next steps took place at the national level. Uh, and the issue was about the resale of e-books, so things that usually private individuals also um, consume in relatively large amounts today. And um, non surprising, at least for you lawyers, two national courts, based on a very similar fact pattern, gave different decisions, arguing with the same legal document at European level, namely the InfoSoc Directive. So the European Court of Justice had permitted the resale of software, but then the next court that dealt with the resale of digital content was a German court who said um, it is, under the current German and European legal framework, impossible to resell digital content that one might have purchased online. There were a number of reasons for that. One of those reasons was that e-books cannot be uh, compared to real hardcover or softcover books. This was only one of the reasons the German court invoked to deny individuals the resale um, of their e-books they had purchased via the German site Buch.de. A uh, very similar case in the Netherlands, as I said, decided differently. Um, they're not directly comparable because the procedural background of the Dutch case uh, was slightly different, was an injunction procedure as far as I understood with my limited knowledge of the Dutch language. But the court employed similar arguments. It said, as opposed to the German court, that e-books can be compared to a certain extent uh, to hardcover books. Um, but the result is that you can resell e-books in the Netherlands and you can not resell e-books in Germany for the moment. At European level, the question is widely unsettled because none of the courts dared uh, or could be bothered to refer a question to the European Court of Justice, who would then ultimately have to interpret 
um, this question or the legal provisions on which both courts based their arguments. We had a decision which was by some legal scholars um, said to have decided the question in art and art posters. Again, it didn't really deal with the resale of uh, digital content, but a very, very complicated case about taking ink from a canvas, putting it onto a poster and then reselling that. Um, essentially, this caused a lot of confusion um, among consumers, private individuals, but also among academics. Let's look at the position that users and right holders took in the uh, copyright consultation. Users, it seems, have a desire that or to resell their digital content that they have purchased or otherwise have legal access to. Uh, they think one should not discriminate between tangible goods and digital content. Right holders, on the other side, said, um, picking up the argument of the German course, there is no functional equivalency between digital content and um, physical embodiments uh, of copyright, and therefore they would deny users the right to resale their content. They argue most importantly with piracy, difficulties of enforcement, and so on. And they underlined their contractual freedom, which is a question that has already been discussed this morning, whether one can contractually override limitations and exceptions by contract. We had, briefly after the corporate con consultation, the uh, infamous leaked white paper of the Green Commission, something that never officially came to life. But on the question of digital exhaustion, the leaked white paper in summer 2015 said digital exhaustion is something that's not ripe for decision just yet, which one can only assume is based on the fact that they were looking for an evidence-based approach to corporate reform and they didn't have any evidence yet on the economic impact of digital resale. However, this white paper set, or leaked white paper, it wasn't really a white paper in the strict sense, uh, is that it preferred licensing solutions. Licensing solutions, commercial solutions, should always be looked into before deciding on whether digital content could be resold or not. That was the old commission, and you know all that in summer we had a change, uh, or a new commission um, took up its work, it um, relatively quickly published the digital single market communication, which was entirely silent on the question of digital resale. Something that had been boiling for many, many months or one or two years was completely ignored in the digital single market communication that was published this early autumn. The second aspect that is important for users is user-generated content, as the name suggests. Uh, we didn't have a case that dealt with user-generated content what we know from the internet, you know, videos put up on the internet, uh, internet memes and so on and so on, because we don't really have a legal basis in the current copyright archive for user-generated content. And the closest thing we have is the parody exception, which had been interpreted in the Dagmuin case. Uh, it was uh, in 2014, I gave a pre presentation on that last year already in Vienna. Um, this case is so important from a, in a comparative perspective because user-generated content in the United States is always discussed based on a parody case. Uh, Campbell versus Acuff Rose, a parody of a fami famous pop song, Oh Pretty Woman. Um, the Court of Justice um, defined what a parody is, said it's a concept, but it also opened a fundamental rights dimension, a freedom of speech or freedom of expression dimension, non-discrimination dimension to parody and therefore indirectly to uh, trans transformative works which could be, for example, basic user-generated content. This was picked up by academic opinion, and there are a number of papers that put the parody exception in the context of user-generated content, music mashups and other forms of digital transformative works. Um, but again, we can't really translate Dekmun to non-parody transformative works because, again, we don't have a legal basis in the existing copyright archi at European level. There is no exception for non-parody user-generated content. Um, again, users, as they uh, express their opinion in the um, consultation, prefer a legislative solution to the problem of user-generated content. They want an exception for user-generated content. Um, 
Opposing to this position are, of course, the right holders who said, we prefer licensing solutions. If you want to use something uh, in uh, your own creation, if you want to build your creation on pre-existing works, you need to ask for a license one way or the other. This is how I always understood, for example, the UK copyright exchange, where you would have access to easy licensing mechanisms. But you might be required to pay. Again, we look at the leaked white paper. The leaked white paper says, um, or recognize the importance of user-generated content, but also underline that there might be an economic um, exploitation or an opportunity for ex exploitation in user-generated content. Okay. But it said also that some user-generated content might be subject to an exception and limitation under Article 5 of the InfoSoc Directive. The digital single market strategy, again, was completely mute on the matter of user-generated content. It merely referred rather vaguely to a number of exceptional limitations that could be introduced, and we are still waiting for the introduction of a legislative proposal in that field. What are the consequences of the, the, the ignorance that the current commission, at least, uh, is having towards these two fields in particular, but in general the role of the user uh, in copyright, um, who, of course, is part of this again, infamous balance that copyright is supposed to reflect. We have a high degree of legal uncertainty. If legal questions have not been answered, users don't know what to do. Um, there are also negative effects on fundamental rights, most importantly, the right to freedom of expression. If I cannot create user-generated content, I am not able to express myself critically unless it's a parody, for example. Um, but it also forecloses, for example, secondary markets. Um, business models that are based uh, on digital content, for example, the resale uh, of um, digital content that has been purchased once by users, uh, can infringe upon the right to conduct a business not only of the operator of this online service that enables the resale, but can also uh, imply on the right to property uh, by private individuals. So to sum up, what we currently have at European level is a thorough ignorance of the interests of the users as a group, although they have prominently voiced their opinion in the consultation on the reform of the European copyright rules. Um, the Court of Justice in the student's prudence is slightly hindered because it can only uh, rule on questions th that have been put to the European Court of Justice. And moreover, the European framework is relatively strict right now that there is often not enough breathing space for the Court of Justice to render revolutionary um, decisions as it has done in the past. Um, what the digital single market strategy is widely doing is to fortify the traditional approach of European copyright law to strengthen the right of right holders. And this is certainly from a user perspective nothing we really want to have in the future. There was one notable exception to the original Reda report, these uh, notorious 28 paragraphs uh, how to best reform copyright. Unfortunately, this was watered down, ironically, by a parliamentary committee, not even by the Commission. So even the Parliament is probably not bold enough to advance the issue much further. What we have to do currently is to wait until the European Commission is tabling its legislative proposals, and then we can scream and shout again and complain, probably without much avail. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.